<laughs> so, how, okay, I should say this first. What, uh, what have you been up to the last couple of years? Like, we don't really delve into it too, too deep, but how was your last couple of years with, with COVID and where you are with your career and um, life at the moment? That, yeah, that's a great, that's a great frame. I, everyone's got a, a fun COVID story, uh, a fun rearrangement of life. Mine was such that the year prior to COVID, I came back from overseas, came back to Buffalo and decided to spend some time here. And I thought I'd spend a time, uh, maybe about a year here. Uh, my father had passed away, so I was hanging out with my mom. I thought this is a good time to do this, be here, see people, reconnect, and then try to find a job around here for my own, my own satisfaction, but also just to be around my family. Uh, and then actually uh, the, the month that COVID news broke in, in well, in the Western media in, in January of 20, uh, I got hired for Dubai to go back to the Middle East, which wasn't my first choice to go back overseas. But um, I decided then, uh, or sorry, uh, that, that, that hiring January of 20, then of course got put on hold over the following months. And I was told that they wouldn't let anyone in to the country. So you got hired for a, a, for a, a teaching position? Yeah, back in, back in the Middle East in Dubai in January of, of 20, so but that's just when COVID news is coming oh, out. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they said- the, Two months later, oh, basically. Well, uh, in, if the international press, I, I saw it. I mean, they, they, in January, you could see that it was happening in, in China. And they said, oh, hold on a second. We're, we're going to hold off on this. And then over January, February, March, they kept sending me emails saying, well, we're going to have to wait on this, wait on this. And then by, by May, it was off. And to backtrack, just yeah. so people listening know, um, you are a- yeah. So yeah, to frame this up, yeah. prior to prior to returning to the states in um, 18, 18, 19, um, I was uh, assistant professor of professional writing in Qatar in the Middle East, and I'd been doing jobs like that for the past three decades, overseas, mostly in the states, a little bit teaching writing, language, linguistics, that sort of. Is thing. this Qatar, Jeff? That's Dubai. Dubai. That's Dubai, and you can see islands off the coast there. The the great projects that they have of reclaiming a peculiar word, reclaiming land out at sea in interesting shapes to create more real estate along the coastline. And, and that's where I would... Oh, that's, that's like the super... Uh, uh, that is that the... I don't know what it's called. No, the, the palm. palm that's called the palm. Is that all concrete? Uh, sand. sand. Built, I mean, concrete probably based. Um, and, and then sand on top. And they've got several of those. Qatar has a couple. That's west of there, about 100 miles. Um, but uh, Dubai is where I lived many years ago. And um, What's I'm, that I ocean? Returning. Is on it, the left is the Persian Gulf. On the right is the Indian, uh, the bay to the Indian Ocean. It's called the Gulf of Oman. So, and this is connected to no. This is uh, I'm not sound so stupid. <laughs> oh, no, Africa. Okay, Africa is Africa is just to one the more southwest. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's and connected. they mostly speak English and they in Qatar. Yeah. In Qatar, it's an Arab speaking country, Arab. but because it's an oil rich country like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, they rely almost entirely on foreign workers. So about 90% of the population in Qatar is not Qatari. So Qatari. It's, a, it's a bizarre scenario if you think about it. Yeah. The vast majority of people walking on the streets of Doha, the capital, are not Qatari. Were you in Doha? Yeah, and that's, um, that's probably 80, uh, 70% of the populations in that area. Uh, and you can see some islands built off the coast there that are man-made. I was uh, right there in the center of the city. But yeah, most, most people there speak English because 90% of the population is foreign, and they're mostly from India, Pakistan, uh, the Philippines, and all of them speak usually English as a default language due to their colonial backgrounds. So what was your first teaching position outside of the States? Yeah, so the, uh, just as a simple trajectory, um, I leave Buffalo, I go to college. At college, I start hanging out with a lot of the international students, which I did in Buffalo as well. And... Um, enjoyed teaching English to foreign students at Hamlin and learned that you could teach English overseas. And I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting thing. All I have to do is just speak English and try to help people learn English and I can get a job overseas. And sure enough, that was true. So right after college, I went to Japan for about five, six years and taught there. Which uh, city in Japan? That was uh, the Kobe, Osaka, Kyoto metro area. That's fine, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, it's right, right just south of the J there. If you draw in there, southwest of the J. Southwest more, just off the screen to the left, Kyoto, Osaka, Kobe at the bottom left. And that's uh, a massive metropolitan area there. Wow. It's, um, it's a, 
like population altogether of that area from Kyoto in the middle of the screen to found the it lower nice. left, Kobe. That's probably 20 million people. That doesn't make sense. They live very How many people live in Minneapolis? Uh, metro area is about 3 million. Minneapolis is four. Los Angeles is like? Probably 10, 15 maybe. So double Los Angeles right there. Well, yeah, it could, I mean, it could be. I mean, and then the square miles are probably, you know, a fifth of L.A. because L.A. is so spread out. Mm -hmm. uh, but this place right there. Oh, that's I used to take trains right there. That's my old. Yeah, I know that neighborhood quite well. Um, um, Jeff, like, can you switch to some like images of like that town? Um, that's Osaka right there, downtown. Maybe just like Google image. That looks good, too. Um, OK, so you come here to teach English. Yeah. What is like the is it through a college? No, I, I came on my own. I came just <laughs> with with almost no plan whatsoever. I had had an American tell me, sure, you can go to Japan and teach English. No problem. And I said, well, I don't speak Japanese. That's not, not an issue. You go over there and just speak English. Yeah, that that is downtown. That's Nakanoshima. There's the city government building. Um, and um, so I, I go over there and uh, on, my, on my own. I, I had had a, an American friend say you can do this and then i asked several of my japanese friends in the states who ex as exchange students i said is this true and they said sure so i got a one-way ticket to japan and within a couple of weeks i found a job teaching at a conversation and you school. had no other languages learned yet correct? no i mean i had high school french yeah and my japanese was probably like five words i uh because i went to the dominican oh yeah with my, yeah, my yeah, friends yeah. over new year's and i had taken like spanish like one and two in high school yeah and by like the and we only were there for five days but by like the fourth day and not like a bunch but a handful of times i started saying words that i didn't remember that i knew cool that's great that's which, great like an exaggeration is might have only might have been only been like two or one one yeah. or two times but just to like have something pop up from oh, your psyche that's like Hasn't been touched in 10 years. That, That's pretty cool. That is so rewarding. And then if it can be put to good use, not just trivial use, which, you know, tend to, when you're learning a foreign language in a for, in your own country, it's knowing hard. that foreign language, it's great, but it's kind of trivial in that you pass it on, you pass it back in a test, and maybe you say hi to your friend or whatever. But when you actually function it's required. in the barrio of Los Angeles or Minneapolis, to the extent that we have one, or yeah. overseas someplace, and you, you use it for a purpose. That is, your brain is just lit up. Como se dice, and then you just learn the word. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mimicking. And, it was and so much fun. Getting traction. That's, yeah, my my fond memories of that region right there. So how long was your was this first stint so in this, Japan? Yeah, this was about five, six years. Oh, wow. And the whole, the whole all the way through? No, in total, it was about 10 years. Or I mean, like, when you got there, did you come back at all? Yeah, yeah. So I, I went there, and um, then over the period of, Six and a half, seven years. I spent about five and a half years there. So, so I was on and off. We oh, like 80, 90 eight, yeah, percent. Yeah, most of the time. time. Like yeah. So three years. Come back for the summers or yeah, come back for the summers. One year uh, in the middle of it, I took one year and came back here and, and worked in Minneapolis. And that was about the only time I was in in America really in that in those years. Um, but yeah, yeah. So three years in the middle of nowhere, um, not not this city, um, in a beautiful uh, little place on the north. Um, north of there, about three hours. If you go north to the coast, um, you'll find Yonago. Just a little, yeah. Just uh, to upper left, you'll see Totori, right? Yeah, right there. And then, and then you'll Jeff, draw I'm gonna, in. I'm gonna turn off this cam and then we'll have better service for the thing you do. Yeah, and you draw in on that. Um, Yonago is on the left, on the coastline. Oops, yeah, right there. Much. Just drawing right about there where you're pointing. Yeah, there's Yonago. So I lived there for three years, and that is a that was just an absolute delight. You can see on the left, or sorry, on the right of the map, you'll see a massive green space, which is a, a mountain, which a volcanic mountain. You can see the lines on the earth drawing up towards the center. All those lines are indicating geology or topography, which uh, is indicating you're on a, a massive rise. So you got from the sea level oh, yeah. at zero to the middle of the top mountain is 5,600 feet, and that was my view every day. Uh, living out to the left in town in Yonago. Japan is just the same, not to like vague similarity to Hawaii, but it's basically just a volcano. It's tons of volcanoes. And that's why the the, the onsen, the uh, uh, hot water spring or whatever we call it, is, is everywhere because it's on the Pacific Rim. You've got hot water springs coming out from the, the whatever, the fissures in the earth all around the country there. But there's, there's a, there's, Inland I mean, or and inland and on the yeah, yeah. perimeter? Yeah, I, mean, I think inland and inland is, is a 
asterisk by the word inland because of course you can't really be more than 100 miles from the ocean in japan sure it's so yeah but yeah entirely mountainous i lived in that town for three years and that's where i really started getting in japanese um, because not many people people spoke english and that gave me a, a great opportunity to learn japanese Just fully immersed yeah and to be on the coast yeah i know that area um I've, i have photos of that town that's, wow, in, that's, that's in shimane ken um just off to the west of where i was um yeah and that coastline the the beach the beach um in the summertime spending at the beach in the winter you had a mountain to ski on hiking it was a fabulous place great food great seafood so when you first got there for that first stint yeah i mean you're an outgoing guy how did you like where were you making friends like what was like because like so i mean not like it's that similar but and it's an english speaking town but when i moved to boulder i just remember like finding like a pickup basketball league they're like okay cool i have a little bit of schedule yeah, i'm playing yeah. basketball with these yeah, guys yeah, yeah. and then you know obviously a job is a huge part of it and then you know all the things that make your routine through the day things that pay for your living things that are recreational like what were some of the first few things like recreationally or, or like socially that you did that made you feel a little bit like more at home or at uh, yeah so one thing is you w when you set foot in such a homogenous place uh where 98 percent of the people are japanese um you stand out yeah quite a bit like and, a white uh, thumb sorry <laughs> I don't know, like a white thumb but yeah, you're yeah, white yeah, too, yeah. I guess. you are you are just so conspicuous and that's that's a deal you make i mean that is a, that is you sign the contract when you enter that country i am going to get used to i am throwing myself into the situation where threat especially when you're in the countryside you're being looked at constantly just because they're curious you're, you're different yeah and yeah that's, that's yeah that's something that you do and it's sometimes fun and it's sometimes not so fun and you get an appreciation for being a minority you get appreciation for being a, a movie star because people want your children will ask you for your signature just because they think just because because you you are who knows what they're thinking but yeah you, yeah you um so you get used to that but then you know to the degree to which you're okay with that you know some people can't handle that um you can roll with this you can enjoy it you can um try to avail yourself of opportunities like um just people you, you recognize that people want to learn english they want to learn about a foreign country so then you um you know befriend them or they befriend you and you can join organizations to, uh, to answer your question joining organizations that were the international clubs um at the school where i was teaching for a few years um i was teaching english but then i would also join some of the sports just for fun even though yeah. i was in my mid-20s i love baseball so i kind of would hang out with the baseball team and i'd go to their practices and you know just kind of throw the ball around and just show that i really enjoy playing sports yeah. with them so things like that got me into local society um, do you play any ping pong <laughs> no i don't and ping pong's not that big there just okay. by the way i know southeast i wasn't asia, that, yeah southeast yeah. asia it's huge and my southeast asian friends just mock americans because the way we play ping pong is you know it's like backyard oh like um, badminton you know the way yeah. you play it tends to be ping and they're like <laughs> they are masters i Japan, was thinking I when you were saying avail i yeah. know we do this word stuff when we talk but like avail availability it's the same mm -hmm. exact thing right yeah so the, yeah you avail yourself of something and then available, it, yeah. you make it available or it becomes available yeah, i'm not sure what veil itself means it has to do with value or not uh oh we won't go down that path right now <laughs> uh yeah so but that was three years in the middle of J the japanese people don't even know when i talk about that town yonago people will say what it's a it's a it is such a unknown place that um like i said most japanese people would say what so what's the population here just about a hundred thousand people which is tiny compared it, to over there it is a blip is on it the spread map. out or stacked i just imagine like a stacks a really yeah, stacked, yeah if like, you draw out just a, it's all mountainous and yeah volcano? if you draw out again jeff just a just a tad yeah right about there so you see the urban area from uh, where you're pointing that's the center of town um like yonago castle ruins yonago from there up to the coast is about two miles two, three miles probably oh right okay so, so there's that that peninsula that goes up to the upper left um the sakai peninsula i think you know that's what is it 12 miles 15 miles um and it's almost entirely urban uh you're living in very cramped quarters um, how does the currency exchange work for like rent so like do you have like a u.s exchange of idea of like what it costs to live well this is a quite a while ago i think my rent for a room smaller than the studio here uh one room with a side restroom uh and this is corner. like 20 years yeah, ago 30, 30 years ago okay yeah. that was 600 dollars maybe so it had been like around probably 2000 now probably, I, I wouldn't doubt it yeah i, wouldn't doubt. I mean which you, i guess yeah. is normal i guess for minneapolis or 
Yeah, but for boxes. I mean, we're talking about the space was just very Minimal. restricted. But that's that's what's going on over there. Do you have any contacts or friends from that first stint? Oh my goodness. Um, n nothing current. I don't think I have a current connection. There's there's it's probably some, so many. Yeah, you know, there's uh, maybe five or years ago or so, just the odd email. Uh, my, my connections now are few as well, but the, I, I live there again after these five years, five, six years. I lived there another five years, which was ended about 15 years ago. I a separate stint separate farther stint, down yeah. later on? Yeah. Same yeah. area? Uh, yeah, area? well, that was back in Osaka. Do you need more coffee? No, I'm good, okay. thanks. Um, so in Osaka, I, that, I returned uh, after other things in my life. Uh, I returned and I... Um, I taught mostly at the university that I did research at a, a university of foreign studies and then got a full-time gig teaching at a university, which is what I'm doing now to answer kind of an earlier question, mm -hmm. COVID coming back here, uh, getting a job back in Dubai, just as COVID kicked in, that fell apart. And then I, as, uh, yeah, for the past few semesters, I've been teaching online in, back in Japan at my old university. So that's uh, kind of wrapping that, that sure framework up. Get out and well, yeah, you know, it's some, thank you much. Uh, in some ways, and although in some ways, I would be just pleased to get a full time job here and uh, then go overseas just on whims for travel. But um, yeah, but living overseas is certainly something I've done and I, I can do. And it's got some good things. Japan has got some great things. I really like it. That region you're focusing all that region. I'm quite familiar with and I really like it. The inland sea, which is what you're pointing at right now, is a beautiful kind of Mediterranean like area. Lots of islands dotting a very calm, placid inland sea. Um, yeah, is, it's beautiful. Is camping, uh, like recreationally, uh, it's there. I don't know that it's anything like what we thing. do. It's not, not as, no, not as, certainly I can only think of like Minnesotans. I don't yeah. know what people in Alabama or New Hampshire, maybe we're more like New Hampshire, but think about camping. But Japan, I don't see that many people and I don't see that many campsites. I don't see that many campers. Um, you do have tons of green space, interestingly, with a huge population that the island has about 120 million people. So America has about 330 million people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, a third-ish of American population. Way but less the, size. But the, the size of the land is about the size of California. Yeah, so it's wow. basically a third of America in the size of California. And yet all that green space uh, is available. Just It's nat nature still. So They're more immersed in it all the time versus... Yeah, yeah, you really, I mean, what percentage of the people live in the three areas? The Osaka area you looked at just to the right is Nagoya. That's the third metro. I see that. And Tokyo, I don't know. Those three combined, are they, they I guess, over half the population of the country? Because Tokyo is often considered 30 million people. Osaka, 20 million. I mean, entire metro. Nagoya's okay, got to like be 10 million. Yeah. So there's 60 million people in those three metros. That's half the population, I'm guessing. And then you've got a handful of other cities that are about a million people. Um, and so those, uh, yeah, the so, vast majority of people live in. How old were you when you, so the first teaching stint, how old were you? This is right I after was, college? Uh, yeah, like 22 to 27. Where'd something. you go to school? Hamlin. Oh, cool. That's where my best friend went. Huh. Um, and what what'd you, what was your degree at Hamlin? It was sociology and psychology. Cool. Yeah, that was, uh, that was good in many respects. Do um, you have any like memorable professors that helped yeah, you think a certain yeah, way? One in particular I'm still friends with. Cool. Um, yeah, uh, it was uh, more kind of a philosophically oriented approach to sociology. He was a sociologist, so I really enjoyed that. And then I had one who was a psychology prof who was into decision making, rationality and decision making, which really opened my mind up to that world of the uh, kind of the, the desire, the delight, the notion that we could be rational and then exercising that approach with examples and seeing how we're not particularly rational. And then flipping it over again and say, okay, in that irrational move, how could we rationalize that rational move? How could we see how, wait a second, I'm giving you a decision. We work in decision theory, decision-making theory, where you've got a, a gambling choice of A and B, and we're regularly choosing the wrong choice. We just do this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, outside then, of gambling? Yeah, outside of gambling. Or, you know, a simple thing like I'll give you... Um, I'll give you two choices to make, and I can't remember the examples, but mm. there's, and I'll tell you that there's a 50% chance of winning $75 or a 20% chance of win, winning $300, oh, something right, like right. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we regularly choose, choose the bad choice. <laughs> yeah. um, and you go, okay, so how 
could that be rationalized? How could we understand? It? So that was a great. Uh, What's like a simple definition difference between sociology and psychology? Well, so, yeah, the I, I would say they're on a client. Psych is your brain. Oh, I love how you break stuff down. Yeah, and soch is society. Okay, so I was thinking like systems, but okay, yeah, society. Yeah, um, gotcha. And you could, and then you want to probably want to think about you know looking at the individual um, through more more of a scientific uh, manner where you measure measure individuals' characteristics. And this 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 example of decision making, like um, trying to look at things as more scientifically uh, versus maybe social psychology, where it's you're know, looking at individuals' roles, emotions with another person without using scientific measurements. So that's psychology. Sociology, looking at the bigger group, although you could look at it more scientifically when you're trying to get um, data on large groups of people. Uh, but you could look at it more philosophically, social, social theory, where you're looking at just how we understand society to work. So I'd line up three of them, psychology, that individual, sociology, the group, and then anthropology, probably just the, the group throughout time and area, a much more general th um, approach, but similar to sociology, but I don't know enough about anthropology. But those three, I would line up in a row. So you said you had you were in Japan like majority of five years or seven years? Yeah, well, over seven years, it was about five, five and a half years out of seven. Got this in San Diego. It's like that tiger eye, tiger. Oh, uh, okay. Whatever it's called. That's right, I'm standing. Uh, oh, yeah. That's but, cool. um, so then you came home for a while or you went to uh, the country? Yeah, so after my last Japan thing. This so, is like 26, 27? Yeah, so yeah, about 26, 27, I left Japan thinking, Modeling. I love, I love Japan. I love it. It's great. And I love the language and the food and the culture. I love so many things. And you were like culture. fully lingual. Or, I was, I was or... quite good. Although, um, no, I, I wouldn't. One of the, one of the massive asterisks you have to put by uh, being bilingual in Japanese is uh, speaking a foreign language is one thing, but then reading and oh, writing right. oh, is right. another thing. Whereas, oh, I forgot and, about that. and whereas most every language in the world once you start reading, uh, speaking, reading and writing are just not that big a deal. Seems like it. Chinese and Japanese are on the other side of the moon. It's very important. And no, it's so much more complicated. Oh. So Spanish, you got you already know the alphabet. Oh, you know, two or three letters are different. Okay, whatever. Sure. Arabic, entirely, or let's say it was Cyrillic, Russian. You look at Russian and you go, I can kind of read a couple of letters. Yeah. You've seen, you know, this, remember the old hockey jersey, CC, CCCP was... That's the Soviet Socialist something Communist Republic. Something, yeah. Well, the C is a C, the P at the end is an R. Oh, okay. So you have to get used to that. But they're still sure. using familiar letters. Um, Arabic entirely different looking, although historically based on the same, um, well, base as Cyrillic and Roman letters. Hmm. The Arabic alphabet Alif, Ba, those are the first two letters. So Alpha, hmm. Beta. Um, but you learn X number of letters in Arabic, there you go. Every other language in the world is the same thing. You just, the, uh, the scripts in India, the Devanagari scripts, you just have to learn 20, 40, 60 letters. There you go. Chinese and Japanese, you need to know thousands. So back to um, the, the end of my first career there, I can speak quite well, but... Uh, oh, there's two things. With, another thing was speaking, but um, but the reading and writing, you just you need to know so many of these uh, letters, call them in Japanese, that it takes it's a it's a huge challenge. Um, now another another thing with Japanese speaking, like I spoke everyday Japanese, yeah, but formal Japanese is on another level. Is there a lot to the opposite direction? Is there much slang? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and that's and that's thing where you gave us learning you some and, slang, not really. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure I did. I'm sure, and some by default, just because my friends, you know, you just pick up some, yeah. some words here and there. But the um, the bump from everyday language to the acrolect, the high lect lecture uh, dialect, um, is a big deal. Whereas in English, if you want to speak at a high acrolect, I've never even heard that. Yeah, word. you got a. Is there a third lect or just oh, yeah, dialect? Well, you got, well, you get, oh yeah, dialect is the general thing. Idiolect is your own lect. Oh wow. Um, acro, <laughs> like an acrobat. Yeah. Is a high lect. The basil or basil lect is the base lect. So that's that's like. <laughs> well, we're recording this. So yeah. I can watch this over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've got you got all these different things, but in English, if you think how how proper can you sound in English? What's the most proper you could sound? Sir. You could put on an English accent. Oh well, sorry, yeah. no. I'm but and, and so you could set the phonology. You could change phonology. The royal dialect. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
Should the re RP receive pronunciation? Yeah, yeah. yeah you could do that. Um, what is that? Receive that's, just, that's, that's just the way the king and queen would speak. Hey, and it's, talk in a certain voice. There you are. There you are. So you could you can change your sound, which is what we're doing here. You could change your words. That's what I was English, thinking mostly. But how would you do that in English? What would be a way to change? Home. It? Home. Is that what you just said? Yeah, home. Perfect example. Thanks, Steve. You, you can kind of baffle people with argumentation if you use different words or different syntax, even though your argument might not be any better. You, oh, right. You that makes no sense. You put stick on a pig and all of a sudden it works. My kiss it once before I speak, bake it. you speak with a cool slang, you know, you hear country people sing and they have to sing with that dialect. Otherwise, it doesn't sell. Twang. They have to sound like they're doing this. And then Full moon, kind of, shining bright, like that kind of. Yeah. And if they didn't, if they sounded just like the way we're talking right now, it wouldn't resonate with their audience. It wouldn't also, if you want to sing them. karaoke all week, can sing it. Sweet, sweet. Um, you, earlier, you had the script up a couple times. Sorry about that, Jeff. Um, and the script is kind of cool. Um, that, that's a longer, longer thing. But right there, you're seeing two alphabets in general. Um, katakana, the one that's kind of in the middle there you just touched on, katakana, and then, then hiragana down there. Those are the two ABCs of the country. And off to the right there you see hiragana. Jeff, you can pinch and drag and zoom if your fingers if you want to. Um, the, yeah, katakana, nice. hiragana. So there's just the alphabet. Now this is like Cyrillic for Russian or, in, or Devanagari or Arabic. Mm -hmm. You just learn these and you're done. So that's, that's not much of a challenge. Also do... Uh... This right here, you can go. Boop, boop. Is that going to? What's wrong with that? Oh. It's not. Oh, there's a nice one. That one with the red off there. That's that's money. That's going to take too much. Uh, well, no, it'll take. That's a really good one. Um, I can come to that in a second. First, mm -hmm. you've got katakana hiragana around you. Those are the two ABCs of, the, of Japanese. They're only used in Japan, and they are only. Uh, phonetic. Katakana and? Hiragana. Hiragana. And phon by phonetic, phone, sound, Greek for sound, um, they, as opposed to English, just in case you hadn't realized, English alphabet is not phonetic, it's partially phonetic. So when you see a letter in English, you kind of know how it's pronounced, but not, but not until it's in a word, in a context. So the letter T, we clearly know how to pronounce a T, unless it's at the beginning of the word the. And you say, oh, that's right. We don't pronounce it T phonetically. We have to put it in context. Or to make things a little more problematic, if you put T at the end of a, a short word like pat versus if you put it at the beginning of a word like tap, they both, you might think, are the same versus the. You know the, the T and the is different. But the T at the beginning of tap and the T at the end of pat are actually two different phonetic realizations You'll get it when you put your hand in front of your mouth when you say tap and say t t tap. That's a that's an aspirate. Pat. It's a, a T that t comes out. T it gets blown out. And when you say pat, there's no aspiration. Pat. You don't say pat. Tap. Unless you're really being uh what uh Zubra. overly well, some oh, British dialects. Sorry? <laughs> you're being overly pedantic or you're being like a British dialect where they sometimes do pronounce the T. And they aspirate the T. The, um, set, the, la, the ending T? Yeah, beat? I mean, some dialects will do that, but we don't do that. Pat. Yeah. You would never say pat. Pat that's me. I don't know. Yeah, wow, very, sense. very energetic. Yeah. So the Japanese alphabet, these two of the alphabets, and they have three, two no. of the alphabets are beautiful because each time you see a letter, it's always pronounced the same. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. The, I, the, the high comedy that I come up in my little world is uh, the concept of a spelling bee in English is kind of a funny thing. We have these spelling bees, and they're kind of, okay, that's a... That's a thing to do. You could learn how to memorize. Yeah, okay. And it's a challenge, whatever. In Japanese, those two alphabets, a spelling bee would be comical in that the way you sound, say the word is exactly how you write it. So there's like that, a phonetic like, and and uh, it's a overlap with the. It's a one to one correlation. So the kata, katakana symbol is exactly how it sounds. So the word katakana. Do, you, do you, I can spell the word katakana for you if you'd like? Go for it. Katakana, the way you spell katakana, katakana. Oh, okay. So there's, I get it. There's no question. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I don't want a katakana. And now, those, and so that you've got the two right there, katakana, hiragana, we'll look at those. They are the same alphabets. They're just written differently. And sometimes the letters are the same. So if you look at the K line, the second oh, line Oh, I didn't is see the, the English letters next to it. 
course. If you see the K line at the top, second from the top, you see the letter K on yep. the left side. Yep. And the katakana line, the first one is ka. And it goes kaki kukeko. Now you get to the right side, hiragana. Look at the ka. The I can go up and point it. This go is for easier. It. Yeah, okay. go for it. So it yeah, that ka and then straight to the left, all the way to the left, that ka. They're pretty much the same if you can Written. imagine. Yeah. And they look very similar, minus the little extra. Yeah, and the key, number two, right after that key, and then all the way over, that key. You can see that there's, I hope, I guess. It's hard for me because I'm I'm way too into They it. look similar. Yeah, they've got something it's similar. The, bottom, the second one has a little more of a loop on the bottom. Yeah, exactly. The first one's just like a double cross. Yeah, so you've got, certainly you've got... The second one has a gut. You've got, you've got some, certainly, issues here, but you also have, um, once in a while, you'll have some things that look, resemble each other. Now that's just the larger framework. Um, the the function you might ask, like why would you have two alphabets if they're the same thing? And they yeah, are, why do they? The katakana is used. It's supposed to be used only for uh, foreign words. <sighs> so if we write our names, Steve, you'll use the katakana. That's for foreign. And you'll notice just, a, just simply the kata letters are all more angular. Mm -hmm. The hiraganas are curvier, if that makes sense. Kind of look at the hiragana side, you see more, mm. more curves. The left side, katakana, there's more angles, just as a simple generalization. But the katakana letters on the left side are meant for foreign words. So if you see the word hamburger, this is when I first went over there. I'll get to this one. Let's on, hear it. On, the flight, on the flight over to Japan, <laughs> I was trying to learn the alphabets, and they said, you should start with katakana. Uh, because, because Japanese has already borrowed tons of English words, and they've they've changed the words into they have yeah yeah tons of English words. No, I want to word... jump into like the first language ever now, but that's absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so so um, and this is very common. English has a ton of French words, which is why Spanish is so easy on the surface because English and Fre or French and so they borrowed words even though they were they were earlier. Of a society? Yeah, that's not the way to think about it. Um, um, the way it would be when the two languages first had contact. Oh. Which was more powerful? Us. Yeah, and that's the general thing. So, so they look at us, and we've got more technology. And Germany and Portuguese were earlier contacts still in Dutch. And Europe was, in some ways, you could say, ahead of Japan. No, I wouldn't think oh, more later spiritual. Gift too. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> ninniku. That's uh, ninniku. How do you say it? Ninniku. Ninniku. Yeah. Uh, so so um, you have a ton of English words in Japanese already. So the advice for me going over to Japan was, hey, you want to learn katakana because that's how they write English words. Mm -hmm. So the English word hamburger, they pronounce hambaga. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And the burger. That's they, German, though. They write it with katakana. So if I look at a menu and the menu says, Hambaga, I can read it because I can, if I learned katakana alphabet, I can read that. And then I already know the English word hamburger. And if I have a little imagination, I go hambaga and I read, I go hambaga. <laughs> and then I'm like, done. Excellent. Hambaga. So, uh, and because Japanese is approximately 10% English, 10% of all of Japanese language is English. Really? Now, English is about 30% French. Just to put How much context. Latin? Uh, English? Yeah. Eng uh, probably under 10%, yeah, because we're 30% we're French, and French is Latin, largely, so um, you could say that. But, you know, we have a handful of English, uh, you know, etc. those kind of phrases which are Latin, but for the most part... Does et cetera have a, a longer version of its word? Of it, it just ETC is the word? No, uh, no et cetera is the word. Yeah, et cetera is C-E-T-E-R-A. So et is and, and then C-E-T-R-A is things, or I don't know what, or so on, I don't remember. Okay. Um, so katakana, hiragana are the two basic things. But up in the upper right-hand corner in the red, you've got it very nice. The third one, kanji, that is what makes it all come true. That is the essence of why Japanese is probably the hardest language for anyone to learn, unless you're Chinese. Is this the higher level society thing with the kanji? No, um, it, it, loosely, sorry? Kanji is basically like a... Yeah, kanji. yeah. And the word kan itself, so kanji, uh, in the red there, you have kanji, and then you have two letters. Those two letters are pronounced kanji. The kan means Chinese. Jeff, you should just do a voice memo on your phone. And then send me the... 
but I want to hear you talk. Okay. This is so much fun, Steve. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, back in, I'm back in the saddle here. This is what I um, sort of do in my linguistics class. Okay, so you're in Japan for that stint. Yeah. Then what happens? Okay, so yeah, that's, yeah, back then. So after those five and a half years or so, I, 27 years old, and I knew that I didn't want to be a lifer in Japan. I loved it, I loved it, I loved it, but I thought, I want to go out and do something more. I had, towards the end of my Japanese years, my mid-20s, I had started studying linguistics through the Japanese Ministry of Education. Uh, I did a year course there, and I started getting into things like we're talking about right now. Um, breaking language up into smaller parts, scientifically. Because eventually you worked to help create an English, English or Japanese dictionary. Yeah, eventually, yeah, I was on a dictionary project. Yeah. But we're back to yeah. that. So in, the late, in, in those mid-20s, I'm taking this course through the Ministry of Education, and I'm learning about linguistics, and I'm saying, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. I had a little bit of linguistics as an undergrad, and I, I said, okay, whatever. I didn't have a great pull to it. I liked language more than linguistics, related but different concepts. Um, and in that linguistics class, I thought, this is kind of cool, learning, breaking language up into pieces, both as a, a fun thing and as an understanding thing, but as a way to help me learn language. And this is one sure. thing I like to do. And see patterns probably with all language. Using, yeah, patterns and, and patterns in language and patterns. But themes, pat, not pat turns. Themes but. in the brain, like what is it? What are we doing in our brain? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that, what my brain's doing. Have that I that I could that I could do to um, that I could take my take advantage of to help learn this language. So late twenties, I leave Japan to start a master's degree in linguistics, and that was that was what I'd wanted through to do. Through who? Through Manchester. That was, so I moved to the UK. Whoa! I'd see. I'm glad. With, I, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was um that was my late mid late twenties, and I go over there, and I um I, that was great. I mean, that's that was a great education. It was cool. Um, I, 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 every class I took. So, so linguistics, I could kind of just a, a simple, simple picture that you, you can look at language from a sound, sound point of view, like we talked about phonology, phonetics, phonetics and you just look at the sound. What's Which happening? is like phone, phone, yeah, exactly. Telephone, exactly. Um, so, um, you break, break up words into sounds, all language into sounds and say, okay, what can we, what can we say and think and understand about sounds? And then you can take, you can get a little bigger and say, how about the syllable? So a sound is just that one thing, or we can look inside a sound and look at the smaller parts of a sound and how it's made in the mouth and that sort of thing and how it works in the ear. But sure. um, bigger than a sound, well, and we're not talking about letters on a page. That, that's another thing we look at. We're just looking at speech. Syllable is like just a combined r Like ap apple has apple. You could yeah. say there's two or, you know. Oh, yeah. Dog sorry. has one syllable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dog has three letters, three yeah, sounds, yeah. probably one syllable. So you can look at syllables and how they work. And the change in the sound as the full sound is made. Uh, you could look at the change in the sound, or you could just, yeah, you could just look at how that unit, the unit of a syllable, works, and how it works with other syllables on a sentence, how the way they work is different in one language or another, how it's similar in one language or the other. So you could look at the syllable. You could then look at, and this is before words, you could look at a morpheme. Morpheme. A morpheme is the basic meaning unit within a word. The basic meaning of it. It could be a word. It could be part of a word. I can give you an example, I suppose. Sure. Computer. Computer is not just computer. You can break computer apart and look inside the word computer and you could get the word compute. <laughs> Sorry, I was, yeah. I was listening. Yeah, and with compute, you could break compute in half. And you're not going to get two words, but you're going to get two meaningful units. Common Com pute. And pute. And pute, you go, okay, well, it's probably the same as dispute. Oh, I don't know. Com, you know, com from a hundred words. Mm. Communication, it's the same from Spanish. It's mismo. Is that Como? right? Uh, no, what? It could be. Man. No, com is is con is with. Mm -hmm. C C -O -N. Con. Yeah. con. So that is communication. It's the same as com. Okay. This is one thing you have to kind of put your literalist way of thinking aside and say, okay, com and con, they're the same thing. We're just going to say they're different realizations. Well, they're right next to each other in the alphabet. That, they're one little too, line away, too. That Maybe too, that's literal but, still, though? Uh, yeah, 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 the alphabet, don't let that get in your okay. Just release yourself from that. We're looking at the sound and how it's made in the mouth, for example. Con, com. Um, I don't want to go too far down this because we're just breaking. We're looking at linguistics. is the phonology, the syllables, the morpheme. That's breaking a word into several parts. Uh, the word, how close is that to the... Is that the same spelling as morphine, like... Um, no, pain, it's got the M-O-R-P-H in it, but, and they, they both might mean the same thing, which means to morph, to change. 
So morphine is changing your amount of pain? No, just change. There's no pain involved in morphine. Well, I'm just thinking of like morphine for like a yeah, surgery. Yeah, yeah. And I, so thing. with that morphine, it might be the same change and then applied to physiological state or something like that. Morphology, Heard. well, logi, logo is the word. So changing of the word. Um, so morphology, house. Gosh, this is fun. House, there's only one morphine, just house. Um, Steve, it's just one. That's, that's what that is. Chair, there's just one. Maybe a long Dingus. word. Sorry? Dingus. Dingus? I don't know the <laughs> history of the word dingus, but a long word, a long word could be one morphine. Yeah. Um, but a long word could also have six different. You know, Can you type in that word, pizza. Jeff? Morphine. I want to look at it on. Uh, no, not that. Go to. Um, oh. Go to uh, etymology online. E t y m. E t y m online. O n. The, the g y erase the g y. Oh, sorry. Uh, erase the L O too. Yeah. And now, uh, now N N line. There you go. It's the next one. And we'll go there, and then you can we can have fun there because that's that's where you just just enter that, and you'll get the website, and then you click on the top website, or you can enter the word there. Doesn't matter. I didn't uh, at the end of my Dominican trip. I Type didn't dingus. See what happens. <laughs> at the end of my. It's an idiot. A dumb something, person. Is it us? Is that something that you don't Ding guy, name plural. Uh, name, okay. If something you don't have a name for, is a ding. You know, if that were the case, then ding being <laughs> being correlated with thing. Thing and ding are the... Uh, ding is probably German or Dutch. Ting in Norwegian is thing. Thing is just an anonymous... I know where my clip's going from. Right there. Let's <laughs> see what drives up. Unspecified uh, object. Oh, Look at thing. There it is. Thing. Nice. It, so it comes from thing... And that's like in uh, Norwegian, the all thing Dutch, is Dutch. Dutch dingus. See, Dutch dingus. So here's here's a little lesson on phonology for you. The thing, want the thing in English, and ding in Dutch and German, and ting, those three sounds, d, t, f, all right here, the t, easily morphing, changing. You can look up morphine too. Go, while you're at that website, just look up morphine. Or morphine. We don't need any more coffee. pH and see what happens. Yeah, the first one is morphine. That's fine. Or the bottom one is morphine. Which one? Uh, go to the bottom one. See what happens. Morpheus. Okay, the god of dreams. God so, dreams, yeah. so go there. Hey, I didn't know that. Jeff from the Matrix. And oh, god of dreams, sh form, shape, beauty. So that has. You know, I'm thinking the changing. Well, yeah, to the changing in morphology. Well, I'm gonna read it. Morphine, chief alko alkaloid of opium, used as narcotic painkiller, 1828, from French morphine or German morphine, name coined by German apothecary Frederick. Sir, how do you say his last name? Zedunna. Zedunna. In reference to Latin Morpheus, or or in American Morpheus, the guy from the movie The Matrix with the sunglasses that didn't even hold on to his face. Didn't make any sense. Ovid's. You're right. Ovid's name for the god of dreams from Greek Morphe, form, shape. Steve, please do 100 episodes in a row with me. Yeah. Uh, which is a known <laughs> origin, so called because of, so called because of the drug sleep inducing properties. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, click on Morpheus. The Just Matrix. Three, it makes sense. Click on Morpheus. Jeff, The Matrix. It's crazy. And it's all about the red and blue pill. Okay. Dream. Yeah, and then go down here. I'm a oh, form morph. Um, Semblance? What's that mean? Resembling? Re resembling, yeah. Semblance. Yeah. So what's the difference between resemble and semblance? I'm guessing the re can have to do with uh, intensifying. Um, it can be... Here's a nice fun little thing. So re sometimes means go back. Yep. Um, to return. To redo means kind of do again, which is conceptually related to going back. If you think about going back as going back to alpha, the origin... Alpha. That implies you're going to go. You're going to go back and do it again. Mm -hmm. So returning and doing it again are conceptually related. Does that make sense? Yep. And that's what semblance would be. Well, I'm sorry. No, we're getting into resemblance okay. here. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just talking about re as being mm. a morpheme. Here's here's an example of a morpheme. Re. It's not a word usually. Re. R. E. Not yep. a word. But it's a meaningful part of a of many more words. Yeah. So it can mean to go back to the origin. It can mean go back to the origin and then imply doing it again. So it can mean repeat. And repeating also can mean emphasis. If you're repeating something, it sounds like I'm doing it again. So that resemble could be that emphatic version of doing semble again, like a, a, a stronger version of semblance. Semblance, I just, yeah, it's, it's kind of like resemblance in my mind. But anyway, um, 
morph, 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 shape, morphology. So we're, look, we're looking at meaningful units, and I don't know why, I don't want to get down this track right now, but morphology <laughs> is just a bigger, uh, a bigger chunk of territory you can look at in linguistics. We draw a triangle. Sound, morph, uh, phone, phoneme, um, syllable, bigger one, morpheme, which is a few sounds in a row, and they have a meaning. Because the word, or the sound, b, you know, what does that mean? I, I, I don't know. B oh, I throw up. Or apple. There's two, two syllables, apple, apple. Yeah. Does either one of them have a meaning in and of itself? No. But return, re, I just kind of went into re. Mm -hmm. Most people probably wouldn't say, I know exactly what it means because it's got a little turn. I think everyone's going to say, yeah, there's return and turn. Yeah, I see the meaning. I mean, if think about it, if you're an English language learner, you had to learn, learn the word turn and return. You'd probably double up and go, take a right versus turn around. That's, that's the same T-U-R-N. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, and that T-U-R-N is both a word and a morpheme because it has a meaning inside of another word return. Anyway, so then you get the triangle, sound, syllable, morpheme, and then you can get into word level like studying words and that's my geeky dictionary thing but of course morphemes are a huge part of it words and then yeah and then you get into bigger bigger chunks like a, a phrase form okay a phrase um and then a whole sentence name of the, okay so we're in manchester first. yeah so i go to Manchester. yeah thank good call man well the, so i go back to well, that's great i like it's just like slowly coming yeah. back and then yeah that's, that's that's good so there's manchester the old home so what's that like was, your lo what's like the class load like is it so busy that you can't explore the city and it was it was hardcore it blew any american education out of the water that i'd had do they have uh, like preconceived notions of american students that you had to like i didn't have over? to worry Not about really. that I, I i don't think they really cared yeah and there was nothing like the hand holding that we get in the states mm. <laughs> um it was it was like welcome Here's what you're going to do, and you're going to do it, and there's no... You mean just in general? Yeah, because I remember in the States, different classes I took at the undergraduate and graduate level, where professors were kind of more accepting, and hey, there's your idea. Regardless of this. like current times versus earlier in the 80s and 90s? Yeah, well, I only went to grad... Oh, no, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been to grad school twice in the States, I forgot. Or I've, I've, I've done studies here, college level, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, so I've got some understanding of, of this. I don't have all different fields. I've never done physics, so I don't know what that's like. But um, there, it I think was... torque's really important with that. Sorry? Torque. I just think torque's important with physics. But Pro prob probably is. Probably is. Um, with that Manchester thing, it was just from day one, you were you were deep in studies, and it was. So not... did you ever make it to like any of the football games, the club games, like I, the soccer games? I went to the field several. So I can tell you where I lived right here in this map. Yeah, just hold right there. That's good. <laughs> um, so I lived. You know, there's the palace. There's my Oxford Road. Um, the Met, I lived in here, what, Princess Street? Yeah, okay, Oxford Road. I live probably right about here. Yeah, this is where I live. There's Man, Metro, there's U Miss. University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology would be right around here. My campus was just south of here, several, like five blocks. And this is one of the biggest student districts in all of Europe. Super So cool. does it resemble any kind of American cities at all? Or not uh, really? You know, loosely, probably like Boston. Okay, that makes um, sense. I was, yeah, I was full on. Well, that here. makes sense. Isn't Boston, New England? There you go. And it's Home. Just, and, it's, and it's, you know, not on the XY grid like Minneapolis or Salt Lake City, XY, XY. It's on the way cities have developed historically. So Boston's more like about to that. fit the land more than like North South. Yeah, or? well, they, they did. Yeah, they weren't laying out big plats of land and saying, mm -hmm. let's make this, let's, instead, we'll take a road from Manchester to Liverpool, which is right by there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and so that's how the cities evolved. So yeah, I spent a couple of years there. Had great, great fun. There's yeah, the old main hall. I um, I was on. How many did a lot of magic classes at Hogwarts? Yeah, yeah. It was there was a little of that going on there. Um, this was just when she was writing the book. Actually, this was like late late nineties, um, ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, I guess, something like that. But I um, yeah, yeah. I used to. And I was the um, postgraduate representative, so I did some official work in the building there i was uh i have you ever been up to the university of toronto because that reminds me cause okay I, I drove i road trip back i did a camp i worked as a at a camp in maine after college for three months yeah we road tripped um through quebec and over to 
Toronto and then down through Michigan and stuff. And I was just blown away at University of Toronto. Like the city was really cool. Mm -hmm. Have you been in Toronto? I've been in Toronto, yeah. I've only been there like just for a couple of days, but yeah. one of our friends from camp, what they call, they had a different name for being a, uh, what do you call them near the dorm leader? Oh, like it's, yeah. But in America, what's it called? Yeah, I can't even. RA. All right, all right. Yeah. Resident, whatever it's called. Yeah. And I think in Canada, they're called like, shoot some, like a prefect or one some, of these yes yeah, it sounds like a hogwarts term and yeah. they're the, the they head looked, boy <laughs> dutch <laughs> duchess or something or yeah anywho it, this was uh, that reminded me of manchester okay so you're going yes i'm there, there. And, and while i'm there and i'm taking these classes two years long or four years long uh, it was like a year and a half it was it's a lot of coursework it was very intense. dense yeah all it, year round summer too yeah 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 do you feel do you get burnt out i mean it points out or you just kind of have yeah, like the light yeah, at the I mean, tunnel it, you you just had no choice you threw yourself into it and it was a thing where i was i i, I remember thinking i'm only going to i'm only going to finish this this is all i, I yeah. have no i have nothing hyper focused yeah as best so, it could be so uh i uh i was full on into it and I, I did pretty well i was i was happy enough with my work although i didn't like it enough to continue with a doctorate which would have been okay but um i was happy i didn't because it likely would have been. You What's know, postgrad versus doctorate? It's all. It's all. Same. It's all the thing. So you a have your longer, obviously. Undergrad is the four years, mm. five years of your bachelor degree, and then after that, it's all called postgrad. Yeah. And so as a postgrad, I don't know if I've used these terms, yeah, mixing them up, but postgrad would be masters and your PhD. So I did my masters there, and throughout my time there, I was using Japanese as my focus, which was kind of fun. So when I studied phonology, the sound. I would do a Japanese, I would focus on the Japanese system and do research there. Morphology, syntax. So syntax is the sentence structure. Yep. Um, theories of that, I would use Japanese example. And then on the side of this triangle framework I'm giving you, uh, I would, maybe not the side, is the so socio-historical. Is your framework that you're describing something that's common that we could look up? Yeah, yeah, you could probably find that. If a triangle of linguistics, I don't know what the phrase would be. but um, Linguistic triangle? Yeah, linguistic uh, triangle of linguistics. Yeah, linguistic Shocker. structure. That might be. You might get an image. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'd go to images. Maybe see if an image pops up. And no, that's a, yeah, that's a different thing. Um, on Chip, the bottom right, hot, you see. Type in hot chicks, please. Oh, sorry. On the right, you see some sentence structures. That's classic old school. Those the bottom right. You can go down a little bit more. Uh, yeah, on the right, far right side right there, you'll see a weird shape, not triangle, right right D side there. That one? That's a sentence, that's, that's old school, how you start par dividing a sentence up and then the theories start falling out of that and you're comparing with different languages. So yeah, that's, like yeah, that's, that's not, um, yeah, that's not what I was looking for originally. I was looking for a triangle of, I don't know if you put a triangle of phonology, phonology, morphology, syntax. I don't know. If it's probably not. How about, so back to my one little yeah, yeah. friend friend question of like the places you've been. So you're, how about for uh, Manchester as far as like cut contacts from that time? Um, I am. Oh, actually, yeah. One guy. I've I have just been two people in the last year. I've been in touch with. Let me see if there's more. I mean, that's three, so great. Three. Um, and actually, they are. One of them was in my linguistics program, and one. Was ask what they yeah what they're. Yeah. And one of them's an engineer. He's Greek. It's a very international place. Manchester, uh, but the universities as well are just hugely international. Um, so it be just it was wonderful. You had so many people from different countries. Such great street food, Turkish kebabs all over. The, it was just awesome. But my friends um, in my flat, so I lived in the foreigners uh, foreigners dorm because that's cool. And um, with a couple people or just one person? eight people, we all had individual apartments, and then we shared a common room and a Put kitchen. Your clothes and just laundry baskets out the window and hang them. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, we it was a it was a dorm, but it was laid out like I've seen in the states one or two dorms like this where you don't have your own room or a roommate you have a room and then you share eight people like share a hostel almost kind of in a but sense yeah they're you not moving spots yeah though. you had your own room with a bed and a shower and toilet that sort of thing but you um shared a common yeah, individual room. yeah oh that's nice yeah and then you shared a common room with a tv and a kitchen that sounds perfect yeah it was cool so all the everyone was from a different country and you don't have cell phones yet where you're just exactly. on your phone all day you're like really connected exactly yeah 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 that's, that's awesome. a nice point it was just so obvious this is late 90s 
I'm sure some people had cell phones, but no, none of us did. You were too busy to, to doing your research. But one of my friends is a Greek engineer, and he and I are in touch. Another is a Japanese linguist. Another is a German physical scientist. Is that what you So is? where do these folks live right now? Uh, the J Japanese is in Osaka. The Greek is in Athens. And the German is in Malta. Um, yeah, just... And, so cool too because they're all international but they're also just brilliant <laughs> so it's just fun being around very intelligent well it's people. like you are who you're around i mean that's just that's not how you say it but you just seem to be you kind of position yourself and what's this what's the cliche saying about you know you are the 10 people you hang out with the most or i like that one yeah, yeah, that's not close but <laughs> i tell yeah use some line like that with a friend of mine the other day uh so full-on life there intense Happily, while I was there, um, my mom put me in touch with my grandfather's cousin. Cool. So my grand, my mom's dad is a firstborn American, and his parents were British. So m my great grandparents, uh, my mom's grandma and grandpa, were born in England and Scotland. And one of my grandpa's cousin grew up west, east of Manchester, about an hour, uh, in the Peak District. A little, uh, just charming, 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 over by Yorkshire or by York Way. And I was able to spend some time out there when I had a weekend free and go to see Cousin Louie, this older woman, and she'd show me around the countryside. So I did have Super some... Super cool. Some, this was who, your... My grandfather's first cousin. And my, how yeah. old were they? Uh, 80. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Did and they so, have, uh, you know, kids that you befriended at all? No, or? unfortunately, she was a spinster. So mm, she is... Heather. Yeah, uh, doesn't yeah. work, sorry. So she, um, she lived up there. She was a world traveler. She, a lifelong public servant, and then retired at whatever spinster age. Spinster, spin. She's a dancer? That's a good question. How hmm. spinster comes about? Jeff, look up spinster, please. There you go. That is not how you spell it. Spinster. Yeah, I like that. So insta? There you go. Nice. Spin. Oh, it still found it for you. A spinner of threads. Wow. Oh, so she was... Uh... And then this... That, well, that's what that's not what it means anymore, but um, that's where it comes from. So apparently it means you're not married. This is a, by the way, see, this is a great site. Oh all. my God, you tell me. This is, I live. Maybe just for us mostly, but in yeah. general, this would be awesome to use. This is, yeah, I, this is how I was probably invited to be on that dictionary project because prior to this website, prior to the internet, I would go through the physical books. Mm -hmm. And the physical books, I would end up having my fingers. Think of an old school dictionary and how thick they are. The etymology dictionaries are twice as thick, three times as thick. Because they'll give you a word, but then they'll give you a full paragraph about each word, like we kind of, like we saw here, I would have my finger, because you can't, there's no hyperlinks in a physical document like this. Yeah. I would have my finger in seven pages and pieces of paper and going back and forth. For two or three years, I lived this stuff. Dang, too bad you didn't have a bookmark you could have used. <laughs> no, there's, yeah, they hadn't been invented yet. Um, so that's uh, probably how I got invited to that, that project, um, because I'm just so into this stuff. So she's a spinster. I hung out with her a little bit. I graduated from there. When and did you know, when did you find out she was... Exist, you uh, before her, right? I you went got, over there, before oh, cool. I went over there, so and my parents prepped. were in touch with her, and she had been to the states a few times to visit her family, my my grandpa. Uh, yeah, and so that was an absolute delight to be back in the old world and have that one little connection to the, that world. And I'm legitimately one sixteenth English because there she is, and yeah. my grandpa's cousin. So, have you done? What was the, what's the best thing to use? Ancestry.com or there's probably a lot of them. I've done, uh, I don't know what we you do. You just use your name or do you have to use like DNA? You can do both. You can, you can do the, the physical science side, which is the that DNA thing. That seems like probably more accurate, right? Well, in yes and no. Um, one is that it's probably undeniably like, well, that's who you are. But another thing is it can't tell you who you're, you know, that she's my relative unless she takes the test and it'll say, it looks like she's your second cousin. Well, a removed. lot of people do them, and then they have the data database. Yeah, the database is there, but still, after sibling, even siblings, sometimes I've seen faulty responses. My parents did it, and sometimes my my mom's sister will come back as maybe her first cousin. Gross. Just, I don't know. No, it's just, I'm just saying the physical side is not entirely accurate, but I've done that, and it'll tell you my dad is 100% Norwegian, no question. My mom is. 25% Scottish, 32% German. Yeah. But those numbers shift over time because the data on their side shifts. So, mm, so, so it's, it's accuracy. A yeah. But I certainly, I like that. That's fun. But then the historical, so that's the scientific side. The historical side What's is the name? knowing the people, finding the family Bible, going to the city hall in Yorkshire or in Norway, saying, oh, there's my great grandpa. And there's where my great, great, great grandma was born and blah, blah, blah. So I've done both. And I enjoy both. Like, I don't know any other 
like Johnson, like plenty of like the most common last names, like but like our last name Gilmer, like I know there's other Gilmers, but you know, have you looked it up? That's funny. That's Edinburgh, funny. like from the Last Kingdom. For Joel's, um, for Joel's wedding, for the best man speech. That's I did all that research on when Wright County got settled and where our county came from. Cool. Scotland, and then, like in the 17, early 1800s, the, everybody moved to the big woods, which is what Wright County used to. Be. Oh yeah, yeah. The whole middle part of Minnesota was just the big woods. It wasn't even settled yet. Save that cool. for our next podcast. Cool. Buddy. That's I want to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, Get over here. <laughs> yeah. I will do that. Um Okay. So to stay kind of on the chronological track. Uh so you visit your distant relatives. You're still in post post grad, you call it? Yeah, well post grad is all anything after undergrad. Oh right. Just anything. Generic term. Yeah. So like I term. finished my master's, that's the first thing, and after that you do a PhD. So I finished the master's. Um and I've got time on my hands because it's um, December is the end of that term. I finished probably in November. Um, I go and visit my friend in Paris who, had, who lived in my flat and my friend in Greece. Do some traveling because I've got time on my hands. Nice. I'm just exhausted. This is after? After Jim? my master's, yeah. You're taking I've, a break. I've submitted it. I'm waiting for the grade and all that stuff. And um, so I... Uh, this is like your thesis? Yeah, my master's thesis, yeah. Does that have a title? Yeah, 18th century. So so back to that triangle, that's the scientific. And think about how science loves to divide the physical world. That's what, you know, big part. You can divide the conceptual world, and that's psychology, or divide the social world, sociology. Mm -hmm. But the physical hard science, they divide atoms and, you know, mm -hmm. laws of thermodynamics. So in, soci in, in linguistics, you can do that with the physical things like sound, sound wave. Words are a physical thing you can look at, but then you get the psychological. You, there's, there's that approach, and that's what I did for my coursework, all the focusing on sounds, morphology, syntax. But then for my thesis, I did socio-historical um, language development, language standardization, which was totally cool. Big shift. I looked at the history of and the development of Scots as a different language. And there's something I could kind of... Because they all kind of have speech impediments, right? Something like that. They, um, <laughs> you, you probably have some idea about So, like, Scotland. when it split off and became its own dialect of English? You could, yeah, you could. I mean, it, it's, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky thing to talk about. Um, but that's, it's something, because my, my, actually my mom's, the one woman is English, I just referred to. That's my grandpa's mom. Uh, my grandpa's dad is Scottish, so... I, I was raised being kind of Scottish American on my mom's side. And so I thought, oh, Scotland, cool. I like Scotland. The Scottish story is very cool because it's this problematized the notion of a standard. So you got a standard. And this is back to what we talked about with high, high level language. And high level language is usually the, the educated, the aristocratic, and the people who live near the seeds of power. What does aristocrat mean? Not it's to go the high, high class. Okay, high class, okay yeah. go back. Continue. So, so, um, so the people who speak high class language, their language becomes the official standard. And we have this idea that it's correct. Whereas you and me, well, we don't speak that language. So ours is incorrect. Theirs is the correct language. Because we don't have as much, you know, power over what's happening. Yeah, yeah. It's who, you know, who has the power, they become the ideal. So the powerful, all the same Makes sense. Default, they're the correct way to speak correct way to speak everyday people we have to emulate them either on our own or through the school system which is what, largely what school does we it promotes a standard way of speaking that is historically the oxford london cambridge triangle way of speaking which then we inherit in new england and we produce here blah 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 so scottish english has got this weird spot where it's a country that's almost a country that became a country that is not a country anymore and now it's trying to become a country again but it's part of the UK, but it's historically it's been its own country at different points in time. I'm right now I'm writing, uh, I'm starting to write another article. I just yesterday had an article um, approved by a journal. Thanks. Um, so I'm pleased about that. And the woman back to questions about Osaka. So we've been team teaching together last, uh, for the past year and a half. She said last summer, hey, there's a conference. We should present what we've been doing because we're doing something really cool. I was like, well, I, I agree with that. So we wrote the article 
it was not fun because it's work. And that's kind of what I'm mimicking here. It's not going to be as much work, I guess, but to sit down and to kind of go, this is what I did for a whole semester with this professor. Kind of pulled it out of my ass based on a lot of stuff I do, but I'm working with another person, her. She's got a very different approach. We did our semester. We were kind of recorded it. We're like, oh, how can we put this into a presentation? Summarize it kind of. Not easy. We do it. We do a pretty good job. We're asked to write an article on it. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, doing it. Wow. Okay. Doing it on my own. That would be one thing. Doing it with another brain who's got a different way of thinking. Yeah. That's another. So these are like something, something, something. Just this morning, I got an email from, well, yesterday I got the email from the journal saying, thank you. We approve. I'm like, oh, cool. I, I sent it to my friend. She wrote back, this is awesome. So then she's got notes on this semester. Like, how are we going to, we need to do the same thing, especially because last semester was so weird with online, offline choices. Um, you know, students learning online mm. and offline has been a thing for a long time, but this time it was just different because they got to choose and there's just different issues. Somehow I was going to relate this to what we we're doing here, but generally the notion like, like working together to do something on purpose is just a better thing in general. And it's not easy. It takes more effort than having more of a loose structure. Yeah. yeah Cause the loose, loose thing is, is, is great fun. It's, it's, it's stream of consciousness. It's great fun, but it's almost effortless. Like, like we talked of, about at the coffee shop. Probably. I can't we remember. Did. What are we talking about? Okay. We talked about this exact thing. Okay. Yeah. Cause the, you know, format the, and structure and, oh. um, not just loose association. Yeah. Which and I was kind of saying through our chronological, chronological career timeline, school timeline, jumping off into small tangents felt to me decently structured, but not perfect. Like yeah. This. Yeah. So, and, but, but something to, something to kind of pull back and go, okay, because it, you know, it is fun. It's effortless for us to do this. And it's, I, I like doing this stuff, mm. but you know, to the degree to which you can cordon things and kind of yeah. cordon and coordinate, I don't think they're related. Uh, things is something I would like to see, but and I don't yeah. know that. And well, but whatever you get the three minute takeout thing, that would be a starter for me to just go, for oh, sure. what does that look like, and how does it feel just to see it on a screen? Yeah, and then you know, my my voice presentation, lo the logic, and how far yeah. I'm skipping ahead in ideas, and what I'm not addressing because this is big picture stuff, which is gonna be helpful. Oh, shit, there you go, coordinate, and then cordon is cordon might be an abbreviation to cordon something off. You sure think it'd be right, although that cord could be heart. In cord, coordinate, I mean in cordon. So here you got two morphemes. So, yeah, so you got two morphemes, com, with, together, just like Spanish, and then order. Order itself might have two morphemes if we really get picky, but it could be the RT route of Indo European. Order could be R and T historically. This gets way too, way too, way too. Click on order, will you, Jeff? R, yeah, it's R root, fit together, so that's like art. Oh, this gets to be too much to read and process yeah. and too Body iffy. of persons living under religious discipline. Oh, that's not right. So that the pi R square, <laughs> pi root, pi right there is a great little, that's, that's what we're looking at. The P-I-E, Proto-Indo-European, and that's where... 99% of the European languages come from, a bunch of South Asian language come from, Sanskrit is like the mother of that group, and they all come from this root, and that's what we're looking at with etymology, with morphology. If we go back as far as history can take us, 2,000 years, 3,000 years ago, we might find some bits and pieces of Hindi or Persian or Greek or Latin or whatever, and they will give us hints about that AR, and the asterisk on the left of A means it's positive, it's hypothetical. Uh, and so, uh, so it's not like a word that's written. It's just that, you know, in Persian and Greek and Norwegian, we all have words that are kind of like sounding like spelling like that. And it means something like to fit together. And that means we have the basis of <laughs> Proto-Indo-European. I don't know what to say about that. How, how recently something has to be written before it's just like completely different? Could be completely different from its origins. Like, say, like something was written two thousand years ago, it's been translated and retranslated however many times. Mm -hmm. How soon back? Or what's the question? Man? How like how sh how recently would something have to been come up with not be just completely different than its original meaning potentially? 
mistranslation. Yeah, okay, I, I, I like the direction. So, but, and, and it is tough to, to, to say the things. How recently can you just kind of say that one more? So from point, it, from point zero, 3,000 years ago, where let's say the word, yeah. we're pointing to that time, how, what's, the, try to say it one more time for me. Like, how does it complete? When, at what time does it completely like, how change? How long does it take for something to just completely lose its original meaning? Uh, okay, yeah. The, me, I would say a generation, really, because as soon as an, a group of kids get a hold of a word. So, it could, so it's just like, there's completely like three or four levels of separation, like two or three generations could completely change something. Oh, yeah. And if they give me a minute here, one, generational differences, honestly, you know this. That we just manipulate words and this is there's one 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 approach here is that you have a limited number of sounds and although huge a limited number of words in a language reality and conceptualization are far 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 greater than that inventory of words yeah you got a billion words in your language how many ways can you conceive of reality how many things are in the real world and, and then times the number of different points of view and ways you can see that it's bigger than a billion. It's bigger than whatever the number of words you have out there. So we're always stretching the form that we have. It's like, chaos, it's like the on the line between order and chaos, basically. Like, like could, the chaotic what was the, what is the... the new word you heard? They would say, I mean, that's just dumb kid slang. Yeah, like they would say bet. Like when you say, uh, I agree with you. we're in a wind tonight, and like bet. Okay, like you bet, you bet or something. Yeah. So, so, I mean, there's just or a facts. simple example. You know we did this. You know this is unremarkable. Um, and then they, they, they rise into society and they morph into whatever are the elders. And then they have to temper their language. And one word wins out. But for the most part, their slang disappears. But that, that tendency is going to happen always. So to kind of answer that question, a generation... But also, again, thinking about reality is much bigger than communication, is much bigger than words. Our imagination is much bigger than this. So we're constantly using word forms that we already have in a language and we're stretching their bounds to buy new territory, more new conceptual territory. So the stretching of words just happens continuously. And I want to be able to come up with an example because there are some that I know that it's not on, the top of the, not on the tip of my tongue right now, where we have a morpheme, a word, an etym, an etymology, a base, and you've got two different, we have opposite meanings of the same word. See if I can come up with one where you'll have literally opposite, like the same word has opposite meanings. Tap in and situations. pat. <laughs> Sorry. That's it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, same word. Well, there you go. Contronym. Nice. Mm, that definitely sounds right. Now that we had break okay, the words well, down. So yeah, much contra. So there you go. Dust the strawberries and dust the strawberries is not the example I was thinking about, but there's, there's a, something bold. Thank you. To okay. separate by fleeing or to hold together. Oh, cool. Bolt. That makes sense. Bound. Going towards a destination or restrained from moving. That's super cool. I didn't think about this. I've never thought of this. Buckle and now, now think how they're logically motivated. That's the thing. How is it logically? This is back to the thing. How is it logically motivated? I mean, this is preposterous. This is illogical. You could have the opposite meaning. How is it logical? To separate... Because there's just... People are lazy and use the same words for different well, things. Well, there's that. But how is the meaning? Like, how could the meaning have the opposite meaning? How can the meaning have A? A means one and A means negative one. I would that's, just still say that they just didn't want to make a new word, so they just, I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, and that's, I mean, because this is one, maybe that word is kind of funny you said that, because this is what I tell my students. Humans are lazy and clever, and this is where we're doing both. Why make up a new word when you can take, here, here it is, here it is, um, decimate. You guys know what decimate means? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Like yesterday morning at 6 a.m., I decimated my opponents in the basketball court. Sweet. Decimate means what? To destroy? Destroy, yeah. D don't dial it up. Wait a second. Before you type it in, what do you think it means means? I mean, you know what it means. It means to, to dissemble. To dissemble, maybe? Okay. Um, but we know our first, our interpretation, it means wipe out, right? What it, yeah, yeah. And so and what does it mean then? Well, so one, they, if, say, a certain, I don't know, group soldiers or platoon or whatever under a certain general's general's order fails they are decimated by one in ten is executed exactly exactly so literally it means one out of ten is killed, is killed yeah. now does that mean the meaning we're using it now we only had ten no, guys in the court you would say, you would say what decimates is like absolutely 
Exactly. So you're almost, so you're, so you're I, I don't know. I, oh, I, Desi, I, like 10, Desi? 10 means 10. Yeah, Desi. Ten so, 10. so, I don't know. How, Jeff, how do you do that in your brain? How does it go from its literal meaning to our, our modern meaning? Seems Just a new flashy word. Oh, did it just no, we're good. Just like a new, I think it's almost just because it's a cool word. It's cool a cool word? word and then it's Phonetically, it sounds pleasing. Something that's similar meaning and just use it more for every, just like, okay. like you said, stretch it to so cover more ground yeah, until, it yeah, covers, yeah. until it covers the opposite. How about you, Don? What do you, hunch? Why it goes from one out of 10 to kind of every, when you say decimate, it sounds like 100% now. Decimate sounds like all Well, isn't there a Marxist? Like, like, I know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Isn't there like a Marxist term that everything opposite is within its? Oh, nice. That's good. Yeah. Something like that. That's the antithesis is in within the thesis. Yeah, something like that. Um, I'm guessing because I I don't have the reason reason, but my guess is, uh, w if you were to take your group of ten and you're a pretty tight knit group of ten, mm -hmm. and you're, you know, the dude takes out one of them. That morally, I, my, my, my hunch about this, and I'm not right, I'm just, this is my moral, is that just decimates you. Like, you have just ripped out one of our brothers and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, I'm totally making this up. But, you know, you, you see how this went from one out of ten to kind of like everybody. Um, now, that wasn't my first, that, that, that's maybe not the best example of what I was thinking about, but it's, it's kind of clearly massively stretched the meaning. Like, my, maybe it's Yeah. Kind of yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, and actually, can you type in the word tenth? But yeah, literal to emotional. I mean, those two things and, and see how logic and, and pathos emotions run. And click on the TH after 10 in the red. Uh, the TH, yeah. Oh, and I forgot. Was it, is it the second one? Because you got TH. Do you remember which one it was? Maybe you have to go back. I can't remember. Well, it was one or two. Yeah, that's just one. Okay. So it means word forming ordinal. So this ordinal, that means first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Uh, well, okay, so I don't have a great thing to say about this because it has two morphemes in it, right? Tenth has 10 and then it has th. Yeah? 10 is a morpheme, it means 10, and th has this ordinal meaning. Um, but think about the word tenth right there. When you say one tenth or tenth, you're actually getting the opposite meaning of ten. When you say uh, one tenth is a decimal, one tenth is one out of ten. It's, you know, it's one tenth. It's not the other nine tenths. It's actually it's like taking, changing the line in the fraction. Exactly. It's take, it's the opposite meaning, but you're using the same form. Why clever, lazy? I mean, to, why make They're up right a They're right next to each word? other. You yeah, flip if, them. If you, had a, if you had to say, hey, there's going to be this new thing in numbers where we're looking at, you know, half and quarter and whatever. Well, how about, how about when we're looking at one out of every 10? Well, we're going to call it a quarg because <laughs> we have to think of a new word. So we're going to yeah. call it a quarg. Like, what the hell's Why? Why not just do this thing, manipulate this? So 10th is a good example of uh, indicating this idea of negation, negation being antithesis and thesis and maybe in the same word. Like, you've got the opposites right there. This is kind of like, uh, oh no, double negative. I don't know if it's like double negative or not. So what is a double negative? A positive. A double negative is a positive, except... <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Exactly. I and, can't not. Exactly. And so if I say I ain't never going, you know, the school teacher, Steve Markby, is going to correct that, right? Because the, the, one part of society tells us that that's not the correct way to say. And as Dom points out correctly, that that is a, you know, two negatives make a positive. In what way? Because uh, two reverses is one color. You're reversing the reverse. Okay, or double negative, like a negative and a negative equals positive. Can you think of any other templates where that is true? Right. Yeah, and which part of math? Oh, yeah. Which, uh, Two two negatives make a positive in what and how do you, what what's an example of that in math? Oh, just like negative two times negative two. Exactly. In in multiplication, two negatives equal a positive. But in addition, when you add two together, when you add two negatives, it just 
it just compounds itself, which is kind of like your argument. Of, Why is that? Well, that's why I, I never understood that. It always bothered me. That's why algebra was so hard for me. Is yeah. They, the rules kind of don't make sense, but they're so specific and they work every time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. But, but back to your, you know, the thing about grammar is like when you say usage, I mean, usage is another aspect of double negatives. Like when someone says they ain't never going to do that, do you think they really mean they're going to do that and they're just fooling you because they're using it? Incorrectly, according to yeah, some standard of English. Fully, they're just speaking improperly. Well, it, that's that's back to the, the who's proper language and blah blah blah. They're just using it. I would say, like addition. Emphasis. They're adding. You're, you're you're doubling down. You're saying negative negative, and two negatives just mean more negative. So it's clearly logical, but it's uh, it's got it's got an example of uh, I think maybe related to this. Uh, no, it ain't. Um, this thing of finding opposite meanings within the same morpheme, and that's what, how I started out on this. And I'm trying to think of one example, but there's, there's certainly some where the same word um, produces diametrically opposed meanings, even though it's the same word. Uh, and that, those, that contronyms you had up there earlier was a good example. But that's I, a cool word, contronym. I've never heard of that. Synonym, contronym, is there another one? Antonym? Antonym, yeah. Antonym. The opposite. Sorry? Besides, those, is there more than those three? Uh, I'm Sorry? Monotonym. This wouldn't that wow. just mean one? That would be good. A word with only one meaning. <laughs> I, I should know. I want to know. I so should know this. Tangent back to the chronological wow. of school. So, do you have any fun little stories from like the travels after post grad in Manchester? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, within England, you know, those those occasions. But then after England, I. Uh, Finished up, I go visit my friend in Paris, and he was a flatmate. And then the two of us go to Greece to visit the guy who is our Greek flatmate and with whom I'm just recently had a Christmas Christmas letter from. Nice. And that's fun, hanging out there. And then from Greece, ah, you know, from Greece. This is kind of interesting. Well, not really. I know you're not going to forget this thought. Uh, two questions I want to ask after this are yeah. your favorite slang words you've used that you learned in England. Okay. And also, like, in your travels, if you know, I mean, obviously, for sure, when you're speaking Japanese you have the dialect and the tone, but like, did you start kind of having like an English accent at all? Did you start talking a little bit English? Okay. Yeah. So okay. Pause, Try to get this. Yeah. Okay. Later, but yeah. Your fun story you just had from. Yeah. Yeah. So I leave Greece and I, and I'm heading to Norway and here's a, here's a sidebar too. So I did go before I finished the Manchester, uh, my mom and dad came over to visit me and they were going to go to Norway for the family reunion. So my grand, two of my grandparents are from Norwegian. And so they have a summer reunion in Norway and uh, my parents had never been over there. And I was in England. They said, Steve, we're going to go there. And I said, I'm going to go too. So mom and dad came to visit me in England. And then I went not with them, but at the same time, I went over to Norway and hung out with my Norwegian cousins for a week and had an absolute ball, just ate it up. Mutual love fest. We all got along great. I've been over there tons of times since then. So then what my, city is that? Uh, it's uh, called Voss. That famous drinking water, V-O-S-S. -S, oh, cool. That's named after my hometown, even though, as they say, it's not from there. They're just using the good name, which Makes no apparently sense. has the has some of the best drinking water within Norway, which is saying something. That's placebo. Because Norwegian is, Nor Norwegian water, is just, you can drink out of the streams there. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah, down, sorry, down south. Uh, and Bergen on the left, lower left. Dryan, and then to the right of Bergen, about halfway. Oh, upper Vossavangen. There it is. That's the hometown. So you can kind of hang there for a second. So I go there, actually go north of there, about half the screen size, and a little bit more, another half the screen size. Oh, I guess another couple more. Oh, yeah, yeah, there. Now draw in. Half the screen yet. size, that's a good now, direction. Now go, yeah, exactly. Go up the screen, double the screen size north. I mean, draw up. <laughs> Perfect. Know, drag, yeah, and now, now you see Merkdown. That's my home. That is my last name, Merk. Mirkve. Oh, and where Mirkdal cool. camping is, drawn right there, the camping site. That is the farm. That's the campsite. Stig Ireland, that's my cousin. Stig Ireland, Jordalen. And, uh, and the Kunst Tandwerk, that's my cousin's. So that's a German pronunciation. And maybe right. if you go a little bit higher out, Jeff, it might, like, you're like, oh, that goes. Yeah, and there's the, Mir there's the little river right by the house. That's where my grandparents came from, my grandfather. So Mirk Mirkdalen is the dark gale, the dark valley, and Mirkve is the uh, dark woods. Is this too simple of a thought, but. Are a lot of names 
just originate from the town you live in because they're so small? Two, yeah, there's usually, I think, three, three versions of last names. One is the son of someone. One is the job you have, a smith, for example. Your last name's Smith. That means you're a blacksmith or oh, whatever. really? And you got a handful of jobs, Croft, you know, names that that's what so you did. So if you were like a butt wiper, that'd be just the worst. That would be tough, yeah. Or, 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 or butt wiper? You know, or, 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 oh my God, they are making a huge development there in North. I wonder how old Google Maps is. Oh, a couple that's years. Too bad. Anyway, that's my oh, grandparents' old area. And then the other one is named uh, after the place where you're from. So Dark Valley is my last name, or Dark Forest. Yeah. That's such a cool last name, Dark Forest or oh, Dark Valley. Especially if you ever watch the Tolkien. I don't know if you guys are into Tolkien at all. Who's the, that? The Mirkwood. The Mirkwood? Uh -huh. That's literally my last name, the Mirkwood, the Dark Forest. So Damn. that's where they go crazy. I already film. thought you were cool. Ding dong. Yeah. Ding that's, guess, you mean. That's, watch it. That's the, yeah, that's the valley. Anyway, so I go there for a week um, towards the end of my master's, hit it off with my cousins, and they say, what are you doing after you finish your master's? And I say, oh, not much. And then they say, well, after Greece, why don't you come visit? So after I go to Greece with my parish, my French friend, the Greek friend, we hang out for a week there. And then nothing I too make... crazy in that trip. Not like I need a crazy story, but nothing too remarkable. Just a no, fun, just really beautiful area. Just great. Like my friend is from a small town. We hang out in Athens for a while, and then we go to a small town. And it's the home of the Olympics is right by there, like the Greek, the, yeah, the yeah. Greek Olympics. Um, yeah, just, just good, 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 good stuff. Um, but after that, then I go up to up to uh, Western Europe, go to Belgium. A friend of mine is hanging out and living in Belgium. She's from Monticello. And uh, we're hanging out there. She knows Eric's mother's family, um, mm -hmm. Doyle, the Doyles. And so she, yeah. you know, these kind of connections are just kind of fun. And then I go up to Norway for about a month and live really with my cousins in the middle of nowhere up in Merkdalen. So, so do you already have like your degree and stuff? From... Yeah, well, it's it's just, you know, that I've finished all my work. They just have to okay it. forward. They have to okay it. And they, and they do. So I was happy about that. So that's uh, the end of 97. Well, yeah, it's so it's November, December. Um, hiking. It's winter then? It's, it's already winter. We're cross-country skiing a lot oh, cool. up there, up on that map. I mean, there's, there's some Are the trails. people very... Not like beautiful, but are the people look a certain way, or are they I suppose just what, kind of look like Americans? I suppose, yeah, like me. Yeah, like <laughs> unsurprisingly, us. yeah, uh, yeah. They're they're so not. I have met like some Swedish people that are just gorgeous. Yeah, you um, know? and the, the men the, and women. The classic blonde hair scenario is yeah certainly in Norway, but it's Sweden and Finland are really the hub of the blondes. Um, we got a fair amount in the family, and and a lot of people who are they're just so physically two, act, one, two, three, <laughs> physically active. They're healthy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, eat, they eat good food. Oh, they be. don't. They're not. They're not living sloven, slovenly. I guess. Uh, T o o t s one two three. Toots one two three. Now the whole world is going to know that. My dad's hotspot is now worldwide. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So um. So not much hiking then because winter is set on. I did some walks. It it got cold up there. I'll tell you, Norway is not as cold as Minnesota unless you go inland. The coast of Norway is coast. Mild. It's yeah, it's but and that's Bergen, the main city on the on the west coast. There, it doesn't snow much in the winter; it rains. But you come in a hundred kilometers, sixty miles to Ber to Voss, where we're the bigger town, mm -hmm. and you know it's getting colder. But you get up in the valley where we're from, and you you have those nights where when you're walking on the snow, it's creaking. Like a couple of days ago. Yeah, 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 that kind of good solid winter. So I did some hikes there and some skiing there. They've got some good uh, good size hills mountains there and so there's a couple ski resorts do you remember like what any of the peaks uh height was that's okay jeff We're yeah good. yeah the highest peak there is two four six eight meters oh really so not high you know nine thousand feet i don't know what is that it's not it's not ten thousand feet um but, but it's, it's not nothing yeah but but it's near the ocean so therefore it's more vertical than ten thousand feet and like the whatever mm, the feels the rockies are 14 but they start at five so they're only nine yeah that, makes that should help that you don't even think about that. Yeah. I mean, when, you know. So Aesthetically, it's much more mountainous than, like you said, Colorado. But yeah, nine, I mean, the, I the mountain, when you're coming into the color, when you're driving, you see that wall, and it's amplified all the more because you're coming out of the plains. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and then they're big mountains, but they're not 14,000 feet high. They're 9,000 feet high because they're yeah. coming out of a base. But So it's maybe like that. But Norway is incredibly craggy, rocky, cool, gnarly mountains. Um, but for the most part, it's uh, the mountains are often... They're certainly there, but for the most part, you're in the valley. Like the whole country is valleys, or the western part of the country. You're just in valleys, 
and then you then the mountains rise up and then they're fjell f-j-e-l-l flat area so a lot of the mountaintop is just a huge you know, it goes up and then there's just rocky craggy lord of the rings sorry yeah just don't gnarly, be sorry ever for that gnarly territory um it's it's so cool and that's where we've got like a summer hut summer cabin we my family not me but um i've been up there numerous times hiking and you're just up in the middle and i mean you just see and you're drinking out of the streams and there's snowpack until Some july august 40 feet up the stream like come, come on guy yeah and there is, is hardly anyone up there uh yeah so i had, I had awesome. great, great adventures then for that month came back for christmas uh and then i've been back well there's still lots dozen. of travel since like that story when norway obviously i yeah. think we should bookmark it okay mark for okay. the next time whenever we can do another one sure and do more like travels and histories and then you know in the future we can keep things going yeah that's do more like not not the tangents or tangents but like then maybe have more like uh like topics of i don't know i sure love talking about travel though too so it's hard to well, there's this no could right be, answer this you know? could be parsing it if you i mean i guess you don't really you could like patchwork a couple different sessions together this is what try I'm, and make it more try and make it make more sense. Well, I'm, I'm thinking this too. Whereas I definitely want to have like a little clip today because I'm so jazzed about today. Well, yeah, that's you can find a little. If you yeah, and I'll send it to you like you said, Mark. But, yeah, and and I'm this is I was on the verge of saying something like that too, where you know, and good to stop because we could just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Ninety seven. That's ninety seven. Blah blah blah, and then go on for the next ten years or something like that. But then once, if you want to complete this Steve Martin project, once that's done, then it could be a matter of saying. Hey, which is going to be the travel version? Which is going to be the etymology? Ver- I mean, yeah. are, are, is there an academic? Is there a theme? Are there different themes? Because otherwise, it could just be three hours of just lots and lots and lots of the same thing. Yeah.